a ceasefire between Israel and Lebanon. Hezbollah Deputy Leader Naim Qasem said he supported efforts to secure a truce. Joe Biden cancels trip abroad to oversee hurricane relief. Florida residents brace for Hurricane Milton, less than two weeks after the southeastern U.S. state was hit by Hurricane Helene. And a look at how immigration is affecting the American election. Some Arizonans say immigration is the reason they're voting for former President Donald Trump who has promised to be tougher on illegal immigration. Today is Wednesday, October 9th, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Steve Karish. And I'm Alexis Strope. We begin today, as we often do in the Middle East, as Israel continues its ground and air offensive into Lebanon to root out Hezbollah militants. Hezbollah continues firing missiles toward Israeli cities. There is, however, a glimmer of hope. Reuters' Zachary Goldman has the story. Eleven days after Israel assassinated Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah in an airstrike on a Beirut suburb, Israel said it had killed his replacement. That's according to Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. In a video released on Tuesday, Gallant said Hezbollah is an organization without a head. Nasrallah was eliminated. His replacement was probably also eliminated. Gallant gave no further details, but appeared to be referring to Hashem Safiadin, who has not been heard from publicly since an Israeli airstrike last week. Hezbollah has not commented on Gallant's claim. Safiadin is a cousin to Nasrallah. As head of Hezbollah's executive council, he has overseen the group's political affairs while also sitting on the Jihad Council, which manages its military operations. Safi Adin was not at the September 27th Hezbollah meeting in Beirut's southern suburbs when Israel struck, killing Nasrallah. He had been expected to be named the group's next secretary general. His death would mark another in a series of top Hezbollah commanders killed by Israel in recent weeks. The fighting between Israel and the Lebanese militant group has escalated dramatically, with Israeli commandos raiding Hezbollah bases in southern Lebanon. The Israeli military said it was conducting, quote, limited, localized, targeted operations in Lebanon's southwest, having previously announced such operations in the southeast. Video released by the Israeli army on Tuesday purported to show a captured Hezbollah compound replete with artillery and anti-tank weaponry. Hezbollah and Israel have traded fire for the past year, with the militia group launching rockets into Israel in support of Hamas following its October 7th attack. On Tuesday, Israel said Hezbollah fired more than 100 rockets over the border toward Haifa and the Galilee. In a televised speech on Tuesday, Hezbollah deputy leader Naim Qasem said he supported efforts to secure a truce. He said the group's capabilities were intact, despite what he called painful blows from Israel. It was the first time that he had not mentioned an end to the war in Gaza as a precondition for halting combat on the Israel-Lebanon border. Zachary Goldman of Reuters reporting for us. As we just heard, Hezbollah's deputy leader, Naim Qasim, called for a ceasefire in an address on Tuesday. U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller says that indicates the militant group is on the defensive. So first of all, I did see these reports that Hezbollah now wants a ceasefire. And I delinked th- from Gaza. Yeah, delinked from Gaza. That they, they just want a ceasefire on its own terms. And I think my initial response to this is, where have they been for a year? For a year, the world has been calling on Hezbollah to stop the attacks across the border into Israel. And for a year, Hezbollah said they would not do it unless there was a ceasefire in Gaza. They linked the two when the international community was saying, stop the fighting. And Israel was saying, if Hezbollah stopped attacks across the border, Israel would stop its attacks in response against Hezbollah. So for a year, you had the world calling for this ceasefire. You had Hezbollah refusing to agree to one. And now that Hezbollah is on the back foot and is getting battered, battered, suddenly they've changed their tune and want a ceasefire. Um, I think it's not surprising given the situation they find themselves in. During the briefing, Miller also said that the U.S. was in talks with a number of different players in the Lebanese political spectrum. Israel's offensive against Hezbollah has prompted a renewed bid by some to replace Lebanon's caretaker government and revive the paralyzed state as it grapples with the escalating conflict. And that 
escalating conflict is not only escalating in Lebanon, but in Gaza and the West Bank as well. For a look at the situation on the battlefields, Steve spoke with Andy Pyre. She's an analyst with the Institute for the Study of War. Yeah, so Israel currently has four divisions in southern Lebanon. Uh, These divisions are being used in a focused and delimited operation. Most of the activity is on the immediate border area in, I would say, under 10 Lebanese villages. The forces are clearing Hezbollah weapons warehouses several hundred feet, in some cases, from the Israel-Lebanon border. So we are really not talking about a deep incursion into Lebanese territory here. Israeli forces began operating in western Lebanon today after a week of their ground activity focusing more on the eastern sections of the border. So that is an inflection today, October 8th. Uh, The Israeli air campaign, which is occurring across Lebanon, including in the capital Beirut and uh, deep in the north in the Beqa Valley, seems to be having a much greater impact on Hezbollah's overall operating ability uh, than these limited cross-border ground operations that we're seeing in in the small villages there. What do we know about Hezbollah's overall operating ability? They seem to still be shooting missiles into Israel with no problems. Have the Israeli forces been able to really uh, stifle Hezbollah's activities? Up to this point, uh, we're seeing a pretty consistent rate of attacks from Hezbollah, and they're targeting uh, towns and cities deeper into Israel. Today, they targeted Tel Aviv and Haifa with a, a huge barrage of rockets. So we're not seeing diminished capacity in terms of their indirect fire capability, But what these Israeli uh, ground forces are doing on the border towns are focusing on these uh, Hezbollah special forces operations uh, outposts where they could uh, conduct an October 7th like attack into uh, northern Israel uh, civilian sites, which is what the IDF is, is most chiefly worried about. Now, the Israeli forces have also been active in the West Bank. Can you give us the latest from there? Yes. The West Bank uh, actually saw a lull of activity at the very beginning of October, but that picked up uh, a few days ago with uh, some widespread uh, counterterrorism raids in several refugee camp areas of of the West Bank. Uh, We're seeing... uh, continued militia activity there, but it is by no means at uh, its height that we have seen uh, throughout the past year. And what about in Gaza, where this all started? Israeli forces remain uh, stationed along the two main corridors that they've built in the Gaza Strip, one along uh, Rafah and the Egypt-Gaza Strip border, and then one in the central that we call the Netzrim Corridor. They've also begun uh, two new reclearing operations in the northern and central Gaza Strip over the past several days to combat Hamas reconstitution there. So they are certainly uh, still active in the Gaza Strip, even with all of this happening in Lebanon. Earlier in the week, Israel attacked a mosque and a school in Gaza. Um, Israel claims the mosques and the schools are oftentimes used by Hamas as a shield for their fighters. What do we know about the veracity of this statement? I can tell you that Israeli military correspondents close to the IDF say that Hamas is using these civil relief sites like schools and hospitals to regain some control over Gaza's population uh, by like controlling aid distribution, kind of regain that governance capacity. Junior Hamas commanders are also reportedly reorganizing their degraded units into more cohesive fighting cells from these same civilian sites. And the militias absolutely retain the capabilities to target IDF uh, ground operations and advances in the Gaza Strip, uh, where the IDF has, as I just noted, uh, begun reclearing operations in the northern and the central strip. Uh, That's where they are targeting these sites. Um, And they have now gone in with ground forces, uh, which which leads us to believe that that Hamas uh, is indeed reorganizing in these areas. Andy Parry is an analyst with the Institute for the Study of War. Ms. Parry, thanks for your time. Thanks for your analysis today. 
Thank you so much. VOA's Steve Karish speaking with Andy Perry from the Institute for the Study of War. These are some of the other stories we're following from around the world. The FBI has arrested an Afghan man who officials say was inspired by the Islamic State group and was plotting an Election Day attack targeting large crowds in the U.S. Officials say 27-year-old Nasir Ahmad Tawadi of Oklahoma City ordered AK-47 rifles, liquidated his family's assets, and bought one-way tickets home to Afghanistan. Belarusian authorities say they have launched new criminal investigations against dozens of opposition activists, part of a sweeping crackdown on dissent ahead of next year's presidential vote, in which authoritarian President Alexander Lukashenko intends to seek a seventh term. He has already been in power for more than 30 years. After Lukashenko's previous balloting in 2020, which was seen at home and abroad as rigged, he unleashed brutal repressions in which more than 65,000 people were detained. France's minority government has survived a no-confidence vote just two weeks after taking office, getting over the first hurdle placed by left-wing lawmakers to bring down the new conservative prime minister, Michel Barnier. Turning now to American politics, with just weeks to go before Election Day, Arizona is one of the crucial battlegrounds in the 2024 U.S. presidential race. Both Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump know that winning the state is key to their path to the White House. VOA's immigration reporter Alini Barros is there. Vice President Kamala Harris made her first trip to the U.S.-Mexico border as the Democratic presidential nominee late last month. She walked along a section of a wall built in Douglas, Arizona, during Barack Obama's presidency. Later, at a campaign rally in Douglas, Harris said the country must police its border, but she also called for a better way to welcome immigrants legally. And so we must reform our immigration system to ensure that it works in an orderly way, that it is humane, and that it makes our country stronger. Some Arizonans say immigration is the reason they're voting for former President Donald Trump, who has promised to be tougher on illegal immigration. I have no problem with legal immigration, not at all. But Jane DeGrazia says those who cross illegally don't belong in the U.S. And it's very unfair to our country. It's dangerous. There are over 4.1 million registered voters in Arizona. About 35 percent are registered as Republicans, while just over 29 percent are registered as Democrats. Around 34 percent of voters fall into the other category, which includes independents and those not aligned with the major parties. So the the independent share of the voter pool in Arizona is really growing. Kimball is the chairman of the Citizens Clean Elections Commission in Tucson, Arizona, and he's registered as an independent voter. He says immigration is not everyone's top issue. Republicans are far more likely to say the major issue is immigration. Democrats are far more likely to say the major issue is abortion. Uh, Independents are more likely to say abortion, but not by an overwhelming amount. Arizona is the only battleground state that borders Mexico, and one that dealt with a record number of migrant arrivals in 2023. On the day Harris visited the border, Trump, campaigning in Michigan, again promised to close the border. We will begin the largest deportation operation in American history, and we have no choice but to go. But this young voter says he would like to see an immigration system that didn't keep families apart for so long. It's heartbreaking to see old families be split up. Daniel Gutierrez says his father is a Trump supporter while his mother says she will vote for Harris. So I hear it from both sides. And for the upcoming presidential election, Gutierrez decided to vote for... I'm in decide with the Democratic Party. While some Arizonas know who they will vote for in November, others are more focused on simply getting more people to the polls. Joseph Garcia is executive director of the Get Out the Vote group, Cise Vota. Whatever the issues may be, you know, we want them to be informed voters. And these voters could help decide who wins the White House on November 5th. Alini Barrows, VOA News, Arizona. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden postponed his planned trip to Germany and Angola on Tuesday to oversee the response to Hurricane Milton. 
which is predicted to hit the state of Florida just days after Hurricane Helene ravaged it and much of the southeastern United States. White House Bureau Chief Patsy Wittekuswara has the story. Florida residents brace for Hurricane Milton less than two weeks after the southeastern U.S. state was hit by Hurricane Helene. I am scared. Mirrored. It's bad. <laughs> very scared. Um, we're evacuating. Um, had to get a hotel very far away. It's definitely pretty scary. I've never, my, all of my years living there is definitely the scariest, most hyped up hurricane we've ever had. Downgraded from Category 5 to 4 Tuesday, Milton is projected to make landfall overnight Wednesday with a storm surge much stronger than what some residents experienced during Helene. President Joe Biden postponed his trip to Germany and Angola, scheduled for Thursday, so he can oversee the disaster response. The governor of Florida has been cooperative. He said he's gotten all that he needs. I talked to him again yesterday, and I, and I said, whatever, I said, no, you're doing a great job. It's being all being done well. We thank you for it. And I literally gave my personal phone number. Less than a month to the election, former President Donald Trump has made false claims that the federal government is doing little to assist hurricane victims. The Republican nominee sought to gain a political edge by tying the claims to his Democratic rival, Vice President Kamala Harris. He and she, they send hundreds of billions of dollars. They send hundreds of billions of dollars to foreign nations. And you know what they're giving our people? 750 bucks. Harris attacked Trump for, quote, pushing out disinformation. It's extraordinarily irresponsible. It's about him. It's not about you. And the reality is that FEMA has so many resources that are available to folks who desperately need them. As the politicians traded barbs, Floridians in beach communities followed evacuation orders issued by their governor, Ron DeSantis, who warned of storm surge and flooding. We will have, before landfall, 8,000 National Guard for the state of Florida that will be activated. We have already on hand 34 different search and rescue aircraft. We've never had uh, this many resources prior to a storm. Despite earlier reported tensions, DeSantis, a Republican, said he had received needed support from the Biden administration. Meanwhile, rain and powerful winds battered Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula Tuesday as Milton headed eastwards towards Florida. Pat Suda, Kuswara, VOA News, Washington. VOA's International Edition continues. I'm Alexis Strope. Nigeria is seeing a surge in cholera cases across the country. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control says cholera cases and deaths increased by more than 200 percent this year compared with 2023 levels. Timothy Abizu reports from Abuja as authorities scramble to contain the spread of the disease. Last month, the worst flooding in 30 years ravaged conflict raiding Borno State, worsening an already dire humanitarian situation there. Hundreds of thousands were displaced and moved to overcrowded camps. Borno State Health Commissioner Baba Malam Gana explains. We are now facing a significant public health challenge that demands urgent attention and action. This outbreak is concerning, especially in the aftermath of the flooding incident. The floods have created ideal conditions for the spread of waterborne diseases like cholera by contaminating water sources and disrupting sanit sanitation systems. The Nigerian CDC has launched a national emergency response along with state authorities in an effort to bring numbers down. But Ghana says cases have been surging. We must now act swiftly to prevent further spread of this disease. As part of the flood interventions, responses, Boro State Public Health Emergency Operations Center was immediately converted to a command and control center 
to commence responses which include surveillance, risk communication, and community engagement, as well as essential health services, infection prevention, and, and uh, water sanitation and hygiene. Nigeria's health ministry is sending hundreds of thousands of doses of cholera vaccine to the affected areas to help minimize the impact. Timothy Obiezu, VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. The European Commission has filed a lawsuit over Hungary's so-called sovereignty protection legislation, saying it violates EU law. Opponents see the law as a threat to the few remaining independent media outlets in Hungary. VOA's Eastern Europe bureau chief Miroslava Gungadze has the story from Budapest. Tomas Bodoki founded Atlazo in 2011 as a platform for independent investigative journalism with Atlazo, which means transparent in Hungarian. Bodoki planned to cover corruption, official misconduct, and other critical issues that were becoming more difficult to report on. Mainstream media is under a lot of political pressure in Hungary. And that was part of why I quit my, my mainstream media job and started the non-profit to become free of these pressures. That pressure comes from the government of Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Media analysts have long criticized Orban and his supporters' attempt to control the media scene, shape public opinion and consolidate power. They started to by mainstream media started to occupy the public service media was basically occupied and and filled with the party loyalists and turned into a propaganda tool and also private media outlets were captured by the government and turned in turned into some kind of propaganda uh, tools in 2018, the creation of the Central European Press and Media Foundation, known as KESMA, became a turning point for Hungary's media. It consolidated nearly 500 media outlets into a single pro-government entity. Now, only a few independent media outlets, such as Altazo, Telex and 444, have survived. To keep running, they rely in part on funding from international donors. Gabor Poliak, a media law professor, says Hungary's leadership currently has two media strategies. One pushes a pro-government agenda and it's funded by public media. The other part of the media system, uh, the other media system in Hungary is an independent one. There the journalists uh, are carrying out the same work uh, what the journalists uh, in the Western world, they are making very good investigative uh, uh, articles. But that critical funding is now at risk from Hungary's Sovereignty Protection Office. The state body is tasked with investigating funding sources for media, individuals or civil society. Hungary says the law is needed to protect against what the government calls undue political interference. But government critics, including Altazo and Transparency International on Hungary, were among the first to be targeted. Basically two outlets, non-profits who are uh, very active in anti-corruption and who, who have done a lot to expose the corrupt corruption of the Orban governments in the last decade. Hungarian journalists have expressed alarm. This sovereignty office uh, it was something that we needed to get together and we needed to, uh, to issue uh, a common letter an open letter it stated that is a threat and that is something which is unacceptable the european commission took action too in may it sent a formal letter an opinion underscoring that the legislation does against eu law hungary in its response said the law is to limit foreign funding of political parties but the commission pushed back in october it referred the case to the eu court of justice Moroslava gungadze voa news budapest this has been international edition on the voice of america for pictures, stories, videos, and more, follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Alexis Strope. And I'm Steve Karish. Thanks for listening.